Uh, and then I'd love to introduce uh, Professor Greg Welch uh, from the University of Central Florida, uh, who's going to be backwards. leading our talk on um, the Virtual Experience Research Accelerator, which is a fantastic new user research program uh, and some other user research elements that are going to be applicable to everybody here. So thanks very much, Greg, and take it away. So we need the slides up here when we can. Uh, minor correction, I'm not giving a talk. If I give a talk, you guys would all, you'd all leave. You'd all go up and leave. But so this is a panel. But I am going to talk for a little bit where I'm going to present uh, this new initiative. We have this new system. And then we've got these other three wonderful panelists here who are going to answer some questions. Um, Professor Tabitha Peck from uh, Davidson College. We have, it's on the right here on the slide, Chris, Chris, oh, it says Kristen. Christine. Kristen? Kristen. Christine. Christine. Missing an E. Hempel. Um, from Open Inclusion, and then yes. Jonathan Beaver is a professor. Uh, so Tabitha is a computer scientist. I'm a computer scientist engineer. Um, how would you characterize yourself? Inclusive researcher. Inclusive researcher. Jonathan, philosophy and ethics, and eth specifically ethics, digital ethics, ethics and digital stuff. So, <laughs> all right. That's right. Ethics and digital stuff. Yeah. Ethics and digital <laughs> stuff. We'll take it. The ethics of bits. Uh, so we have two things today, like many things. We have this panel, so I don't want you to think this panel is just it. Um, or if you think it's too much, then you don't have to come for the second thing. So we have breakout later this afternoon where we can have more detailed discussion, okay? Um, this is a big project, so I just want to quickly go over some of the people who are here. Um, there are six principal investigators. Uh, I'm the lead principal investigator somehow. Um, I've been doing VR since the early 90s, VR research academically in a variety of different ways. Then we also have Tabitha, who's one of the PIs, and we also have Shiri, who's one of the PIs on this project, along with these other wonderful people. Then we have five, uh, they're uh, just area investigators, not just, area investigators, of which Jonathan is one, and his area of this whole project is uh, ethics and privacy. And then today, of course, we have Christine here also. So what is this? This is a $5 million four-year grant from the National Science Foundation. It is an unusual grant for those of you who know about grants from the National Science Foundation because it is not for research, per se. It's not money for us and the investigators to go off and get grad students into research. It's to help us build for everyone something called infrastructure, so a big system that will be used by researchers all over the country and eventually all over the world uh, to do human subjects research in particular in XR. Okay, so it's really important that it's not for research. We are building a system, and I'm going to tell you later how we need your help and how, you know, you guys can help us out, okay? So the community in this case that we're building this for is the community of XR researchers, and that includes everyone. Okay, anyone who wants to or might be doing XR research. So what is it? This is a little complicated. Let me just break this down quickly. I'll, I'll tell you right now, if anybody knows what Mechanical Turk is, um, Jeremy Balenson, another PI, hates it when I say this, but I'll say it anyway. Vera is a little bit like Mechanical Turk for XR. Um, so that, if those of you who know what Mechanical, Mechanical Turk is, that should instantly give you a sense of uh, what it is. So let me break this down a little bit. If a researcher is going to do a study with human subjects, want to test something out and want to run 50 people through this to test it out, the way it's typically done is you pick a small place. I picked Orlando, Florida, because that's where I'm from, from, and you bring in people from your neighborhood, typically, run them through this study one person at a time, take their data, collect the data, get the next person, they do it, collect their data, the next person. So it's one at a time, physically coming to the place. Uh, so it's, a, it's cumbersome, it's uh, terrible in the sense that typically you only get a convenience sample. So you get who shows up, and those of us who do this know it's really hard to get people to show up. So it's even harder to try and get the right people to show up. So uh, it's a struggle for researchers, even though researchers want to do that. They absolutely want to do that. Um, so it's slow and it's got all sorts of problems, small sample size. So what is Vera? Vera is going to flip this around a little bit, like a distributed, um, a distributed XR experience, if you will. We will have a pool of, I'll call them the participant pool. So these will be individuals who sign up to be a part of the team 
who will be the users who test the systems. And the idea is that they would be with us for a longer period of time. So they would understand their role. They would have a chance to make some money by periodically running studies. They could do it from the convenience of their homes. They don't have to go anywhere. So the, re the way it would work is the researchers, um, say Tabitha, would come up with a study and she would submit it to Vera. Vera would push it out to all of these people across the country. At whenever they happen to see it, hopefully within a day or two, they can make a choice, do it, not do it. Boom, data gets collected, comes back to a central place. And within you know, maybe a day or two, Tabitha has all of this data from all of these people. So we can do very large, and it shouldn't take any longer. We can do 1,000 people. We could do 10 people. Shouldn't matter, because they're going to happen in parallel. Um, and she'll get all the data. So also, because this pool is a standing pool, they'll be there you know, forever, um, we can choose who they are. So we get to pick populations that allow us to get samples that we want. So populations that are representative of the general population and inclusive, or populations that are specialized in certain ways, depending on what the, the study is. Because the same people are there, we'll be able to do um, replication. We can do something and then later do it again with those same people if we want to for some reason, which is hard to do if you get these people coming in your door one at a time and they go off and go somewhere else. And we can do studies over long periods of time, both of which are things that are very difficult to do uh, in the laboratory. So just summing up. Oh, no, sorry, not summing up. This is a really important point. Okay. So people ask, you know, why are you doing this? And why does the DEIA aspect of this really matter? And our response is there are two things. And you'll see this in the website. And you would see it in the proposal. One is it's societally the right thing to do. The other is it's scientifically the right thing to do. And the community of researchers knows that it's scientifically the right thing to do. They also know it's societally correct. Um, it's just so hard for researchers to do that now. So what we see, Vera, uh, is a tool that will help them do what they know they want to do. But it's more important than that. Vera's role in breaking a particular cycle that I want Tabitha to talk about for a moment is, uh, is really exciting. Um, yeah, so in uh, 2021, uh, some colleagues and I wrote a paper basically a call to action to the, um, the XR research community to basically break the current research cycle. And so what's happening in the current research cycle that we're seeing is that we have what are called M weird researchers. So this is male, Western, educated, uh, what is the I, do you remember? Hmm? <laughs> do you remember I? I don't know, me, I'm weird. Rich. <laughs> it, so it's, it's the people that are coming into, um, into uh, college, colleges that are being studied. And so you're getting these college age students that are coming in and being studied, and we're often only seeing men that are being studied. And so what's happening is, so we have these are the researchers, they're designing the studies for themselves because that's their, um, their population that they're focusing on. Um, the research participants are also falling into this category. So, um, so we've done research looking at who's actually being reported in these studies, and they all fall into this M-weird category. There are some clear exceptions, which is great, but the majority of them are falling into this category, which is then influencing how everything is being designed for the developers. And so this is where we're seeing these form factor issues for the headsets, that they're being designed for this M-weird population. So they're not working for people who have cochlear implants. Um, they also don't work for average-sized women. They're too big. They don't fit us. Um, and many people in this community, yes, yeah, so the, the interpupillary distance of these headsets, so the distance that's set for between your eyes is too wide. So about 40% uh, of women, adult women, are excluded. Um, and so that's actually just coming from the, developmental, the development side. Um, not including the software side, so in terms of how we're actually designing things. So because of the participants, the developers are getting the information to develop for a specific set of group. Then that's actually going into who's using the equipment. So the majority of people who are using it are also these M-weird users. And so that's who's going to become a, the researchers, because they're the ones who are using it the entire time. 
And so um, one of the things in this call to action was looking at, well, how do we get more people into this cycle? How do we, how do we um, get these other VR users so that it can be designed for everyone, studied by everyone, developed by everyone, researched by everyone? And so we see Vera as a way to actually include more people into the research sample, which will help in terms of guiding development so that we're designing for everybody, um, not just one smaller population. Thank you, awesome. And I'll, I'll repeat again, because it's one of the things that excites me the most about all of this is that researchers want this and they just can't do it right now. They practically cannot do it. And so it's really exciting to us to be able to produce something that gives them a tool that they can now do this and actually do things better than they used to. Not for every study in the world that they would ever do, but for a certain set of studies, uh, they can do this. Um, one thing I wanna point out in terms of accessibility with the uh, participants, on the right in Tabitha's diagram here is that there's, there are at least two aspects of accessibility with respect to the participants. One is, of course, if a study comes to them, the application that they're testing needs to be accessible, otherwise they can't participate. Something that's not as obvious is the entire Vera system needs to be accessible. They need to be able to go and see which studies are available. What are the studies? What are the requirements for the studies? What are the, you know, how long is it going to take? All sort, all of that information to be able to select it, to be able to start it, to be able to do it, all needs to be accessible. So those are all, that's all on our radar, um, uh, along with a, a bazillion other things. All right, so participants, the other thing I want to make uh, clear is that the participants are not just workers. They're not just Turkers. That's our vision, is that they're part of the team. Um, they would go into this uh, virtual world typically and select a study, do it, go back to a lobby in the virtual world, select another study, go do it uh, as many times as they want. So we want them to be, uh, we want them to want to participate. We want them to be part of the team. Um, we want to make sure they're compensated fairly. We've worked out financial mechanisms to pay uh, them, even though they're all over the country and all over the world. Um, Yes, again, we want them to feel like they're part of the team. So we want them to feel from before the study starts, during the study, and after the research is done, so they can, for example, follow through and understand where their contribution went. It showed up in this paper, or this paper, or this product, or something like that. So we really want them to understand that they're a part of it. An obvious question some people raise is, well, if you have these same people doing studies over and over and over again, um, is that a problem? So there are trade-offs for that. I can talk to you about them later. But one of the things we would ask them to do is, as a part of the team, their role is to be objective, to be careful, to be diligent, and uh, to, do, to achieve what it is we're trying to achieve, and they know that. All right, so just a quick summary here. Vera will, the vision is that Vera will allow people to do very large numbers, very large samples, big N, very representative samples, as representative or specialized as we want them, um, do things quickly, do it over time, and replicate studies as we need to. Uh, just a couple of quick points. I said a moment ago, specialized. So we're, of course, going to have the standing pool is sort of the general population, but inclusive in that respect. But we also have um, hopes of working with other organizations, and we have had discussions with them in some level of a commitment to talk, at least, uh, with some organizations uh, that, for example, work with VR with older adults. So we could both include them in our general pool, possibly, but we could also allow researchers to do research that's specialized to that population. And that might be possible for researchers who otherwise would not have access to that population, who want to work with that population. So that might enable them to do that. Uh, other end of the age spectrum, children. Uh, we've got a relationship with uh, Melissa and some folks at uh, Look It. Um, a lab that does developmental research for children, and they're excited about bringing XR into that sort of space of things they can do with their kids. And of course, XR access, Sherry being one of our, uh, you know, one of our principal investigators, and I know Dylan's gonna be really involved. It is just you know, a huge thing to have this intersection of those two, uh, those two efforts, and we're really looking forward to that. And Liz, wherever Liz is, she was, obviously was just here. I don't know if she's still in there. She is sitting over there. Uh, Liz, we're very excited to have a relationship with XRA of some sort, so at least to talk 
because we also have a relationship with several companies, but if we have to go to every company and talk to them about what their needs are or what they might want to um, see in Vera, and by the way, we eventually want Vera to be able to be used by companies to do their own research also, going through XRA is just huge for us because our hope is maybe they can be sort of a broker or a common point where we can understand generally what concerns are and also disseminate plans and things uh, more widely. All right, just to finish this up, we need you. We have two big communities. We have people who are using the system eventually and participants uh, who in our pool that we uh, think about, especially with respect to accessibility. But this last point here, um, we need help. We are trying to build a system that will make sure that this community is included, um, that they can have fun with it the way and have a hand in shaping the research that'll break that cycle that uh, Tabitha talked about. But we need help doing that. So if anybody's interested, please come up and see any of us afterwards, myself, Tabitha, or Jonathan. Um, or you can just email me. Um, it, my email's at the end, but it's w at ucf.edu. Don't ask me how I was able to get that, but I was. So it's just w, w at ucf.edu. All right, so we have a couple of, um, uh, a couple of comments, a couple of possible discussion topics for us with the panel here. And again, I just want to remind you guys later, breakout session. But these topics, they were, they're just candidate discussion topics. Um, we realized this morning you guys are great. You have lots of good questions. So we really, we would like to open up the floor to questions at this point. And I'll be honest with you, we weren't sure we were going to do that because we knew that the Vera presentation would take some time and we didn't know how much time we'd have left. But we would like to uh, offer the opportunity for anyone to ask questions. But let me say, please consider your questions more broadly than Vera. Think about research with human subjects in general in XR, and think about research in XR even more broadly. We're here to talk about any of those things and all of those things. There is no boundary between those things. So I have a question in regards to Vera relating to learning from things that happen with Mechanical Turk. Um, one of those areas being technological advancement over the, the lifetime of Mechanical Turk. Um, obviously, if we had started Vera seven years ago, every person in it would be reporting about motion sickness um, and would be getting a very different data response from what's reaction times like, what are different uh, responses. What's Vera's loose strategy or framework around the relationship it's going to have to a rapidly evolving set of sensory inputs, set of uh, responsiveness times between the processors and how comfortable that makes users feel. And then really uh, a population that's going to start like infants in this technology and then grow to become natives in 25 years. Uh, I, I, from my perspective, I'd say the honest answer is we don't know exactly. Um, our focus in the beginning is to build it and make something work and to try and keep it as simple as we can because once that's working and we've demonstrated that it's useful in the simplicity that it is, we can then uh, grow beyond it. But let me ask, you know, Tabitha, for example, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, so I, I guess I'll comment on kind of the, um, the additional add-ons to the technology. So, the, so currently we, we're thinking just initial basic headsets, maybe some basic haptic feedback. But I mean, as people were noting, there's a lot of new technology that's coming out. Eye tracking is going to be going into. In, um, we have additional haptic gloves versus just controllers that might vibrate. Um, and so I guess as that technology develops, the studies and the questions we can ask are also going to develop. And so we will have to figure out how to adapt with it. Um, I guess. One thing that I'm, I'm really excited about were um, kind of some of the comments that Christian had made earlier, just talking about like the mistakes that were made in captioning systems. Um, so with Vera, what we can see is, you know, if we can actually create variations of captioning systems in XR environments, we can actually present them to the world and study them and get feedback. And so we can actually learn from those mistakes and learn those best practices earlier instead of just saying, here's what was done, let's throw it out there. But we can get that feedback from users sooner, hopefully. 
So um, there's just a, two quick things. One is a top down. We're thinking about what we think we're going to need, but then we're also very opportunistic. So from a ground uh, sort of grassroots or bottom up perspective, if people come to us with certain things they want to do with certain populations with certain technology, we could do that. Christine, I'd like to ask you your perspective more broadly on the rapidly changing technology and how how do you how do you deal with that or how do you think about that? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I think you know it was what you were just talking about then, Greg, contextual insight. Insight is not pervasive, it doesn't last across time, it doesn't even last in a moment in time across different contexts. So to really understand, yeah, you know, we've been running disability inclusive and age inclusive research very specifically in immersive technologies for over five years. So those challenges of changing technologies, changing barriers, changing experiences. Our research is very different now to what it was five years ago. Interestingly, the framing of that research is very similar. Understanding what are the design challenges you're framing for? Why is someone needing that question asked and answered now? understanding what's the environment that they're designing into, what are the decisions that that research should be informing. So making sure that that scope is really um, clear and specific. And then being very, you know, we, I often say, all research is incorrect, but some research is useful. So being really honest about where the boundaries of that usefulness is and saying it's useful now in this context, in this moment in time. And I also love to talk about the exclusion footprint in any research and being very explicit. It was as explicit as you can be as who was involved in that study and who wasn't. And therefore, who it does represent and who later research, you know, you can't learn everything in one layer and in one moment in time. We just, you know, boil the ocean and never actually do anything. So to actually do it layer by layer. And the more explicit we can be about what it's not, the easier it is to get the next layer right to inform the next set of, set of decisions in an even better way. Greg, I wonder if you could just clarify a little bit about um, the ways in which Vera is, you see Vera as Mechanical Turk driven and not? Because that might help clarify the well, So one, one way, and maybe you can say a little bit about this, is related to the first point there, secondary research. One of the things we want to do is the data that's collected will be open to be looked at by other researchers who are part of that community. So it can't be everybody in the world, but the people who are vetted and signed up as part of Vera. So when Tabitha runs her study, the data gets collected. There's, our, our plan is that there'll be some period of time during which that'll be embargoed so that Tabitha and her fellow researchers can go off and publish a paper on this. At, after that point, that expiration date, the data as a default would be available to other people in the community. So they could now go in and look for other things. They could build on that. They could learn from it. Um, we're also trying to do things on the front end where people will be aware that Tabitha is going to run a study so they can try and get involved if they want. But the problem, a problem ethically or uh, with the data that I know Jonathan could talk about a little bit is the secondary use. So when participants agree to do something and the data is collected for that purpose, how do we manage uh, looking at that data again and again for other purposes? I don't know, Jonathan. Yeah, I could say, I'll talk for a long time about that, but I want to make sure that we've covered the question. Does that make sense? OK, yeah. yeah sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. I just, I just might add on, and I, I won't belabor the point, but I'm really interested um, not so much on the technology, on, on the data use end. So how do we manage not only primary data questions coming in, but then secondary data questions? Um, this is a huge landscape right now, especially around health data. And I think it's a, it's a disservice to think about XR data as different somehow than health data and ask different questions, because there's such tight overlap. And in fact, I think in XR research, you're collecting a lot more types of data than we are even in health right now. Um, so the, all the questions around secondary consent that we're asking now are the same questions we have to be asking here. I I'm, remember, I'm sure you all know these big case studies too, but back in, I think, 2019, Ascension Health partnered with uh, Google Health. And Ascension Health handed over 50 million identified health records uh, for private research for Google Health to. Um, make its systems better. And that was in line with current federal regulations, in line with HIPAA. That was not against the law in any way. That was currently uh, acceptable. 
But there are lots of big picture ethical questions that don't align with current regulations. And so for me, secondary research has a lot to do with the bottom up sort of individual responsibility. Like what do we as XR researchers want to stimulate as ethical discussions? How do we want to handle secondary research? And there's lots of different models of consent. Um, but the, the tension for me is between participants in the community's interest in protecting their own data, controlling their own data, and these questions that I think Vera is interested in about the greater goods. We can learn a lot if we aggregate data and share it, but how do we do that in a way where participants still have some control over their inputs, which uh, stimulates them to want to be involved, and then also their uh, private information is uh, controllable mm. and protected. And I think that's a real tension, and I think it's something that nobody has figured out right now, and it's a new question, I think, for this group. And I mentioned before, we do eventually want, at least we're, we hope that co companies will be able to use this, corporate research labs, they will be able to use this also. That introduces another potential problem, and Jonathan has pointed out to me before that participants in general feel generally good about doing something that's for the uh, greater good of the community around them, um, less so for helping a company make money. So we have to figure out how to navigate that. Yeah, Christine, please. I can just add a layer to that. I mean, we've got a community of 1,450 people, and the majority of the work we do is for commercial organisations. We work for government as well, um, and for academia, but actually the vast majority is for commercial organisations. People want design that works better for them. So actually, we find that the people, obviously, we're a self-selected yeah. community because people have chosen to be part of an ongoing community to inform better design. But actually, design fails all the time for people with different disabilities and different access needs. So people do want better design and they do want to help inform it. But the consent challenge is a really interesting one when it's hard enough to ask a participant to really clearly and really um, so that they can have informed, understood consent, particularly when you add disability and different communication and understanding and cognition challenges, to really make sure that you have that informed consent to be able to do a study, let alone for a study that may be done in the future that is not yet defined now. And to get that consent now for something in the future that may not be defined now I think is a really interesting challenge. Yeah, the, the consent models here are so fascinating to me because most of us, I think, have clicked the button on the yeah, terms of consent for any number of things that is blanket consent, right? Yeah. This is the model right now in health research. I think it's the model in most, mm -hmm. most research and industry-funded work as well is that you sign away your rights with the expectation that the, the company or the institution is going to do something good with your data, but that's not always the case. Mm -hmm. A good example to me is 23andMe. Has anybody in this room... Um, sent a sample to 23andMe. Yeah. So there's a reason why the CEO of 23andMe is a billionaire, right? And that's not because she's doing something great for you, right? She's doing something great for the corporation. There might be good secondary benefits, right? So she's partnered, uh, the 23andMe has partnered with Merck, for instance, to sell large aggregate data sets for drug development which may or may not have good outcomes, but it does certainly have excellent bottom line implications. Um, so basically the, the image is big data is big business. And any time that you're participating in research or industry funded work, you're giving away your data with the expectation that your data is gonna do something good for the world. I don't think anybody in this room, and I would guess, Christine, most of your participants, aren't giving their data away because they want some company to make more money. And that tension is a real tension. So staged consent, I think, is a really interesting model, right? Thinking about whether we can re-consent participants who have consented to a primary research project for any number of secondary research projects. In the medical realm, that is just too onerous right now. We don't have models for that. But in communities like this, I think those models are, are live. I think we could make that happen. Um, there's lots of really good research about what those models might look like. There's a, there's a great paper, a 2007 paper, actually, on meta-consent laying out a staged model for that. Um, so that's, I think, a direction for me is really seeing that tension, making sure that our participants recognize that their data, while it might do something good, is also worth a lot, right? Uh, to, to Vera, not to, not to say we're out of this bubble, to Vera, to public institutions, to private institutions, and letting them decide when they want to participate. But Greg, I know you and I talked about what that does to the the bottom line, the intellectual bottom line of projects like Vera, if people can opt out, does your data set become then more constrained? Yeah. And how do you handle that? 
Yeah, so I think that's, I mean, we, I want to move on to something else, but I'll say that we got to get this right. We got to figure this out because if we can't get, if we can't make the data accessible beyond that first study, that's a huge part of the vision of it is lost uh, for that. So we've got to figure that out. We got to get it right. But can, can we run a little mini experiment real quick? Okay. Yeah. We, yeah. How many people in this room um, participate in, have participated in research or would? Okay. So, so most of us. All right. For those of us who participate in research, do we do it because we want the research to do greater good, let's say? Okay. How many people are worried about control over their data also? Yeah. So, okay, great. So the little demo there suggests that those two, the value conflict is a real conflict, right? This isn't just an arbitrary thing and it's not specific to communities. We're both at once worried about data and where it goes and how it's handled. And also we want our data to be used for ourselves and for others. And resolving that, I think, is one of the greatest tensions of the big data era and something that our project's going to have to think about. My students would say they do it because their professor tells them to do it. That's part of their well, job. One of my undergraduate students, I, I think they're just um, being grumpy with me, but they'll, they'll be like, I don't care. I don't care about privacy. Like, everybody has my data anyway and like, whatever. Um, and I will say there's a great difference between like tinfoil hat wearing me of a particular generation and my students uh, who some call digital natives, right? These folks are, and XR natives is the, maybe the next thing coming up, right? So there is a difference there, but I worry that our digital natives now don't really recognize the implications of what they're sharing and how and why. I think there's also okay. a difference in marginalized communities where there is an expectation or a lot of experience of exclusion and bias. And therefore, data has a different weight to it. Tabitha, have you seen this in your research too? Is this are your participants worried about these things? So I'll say I ha I, I have not seen that my participants are worried about it. The one thing that I do see when I'm reviewing papers, which really um, really bothers me, is exclusion of data for specific reasons. And so you know. It, I, I see it a lot when, um, when people are reporting gender data. So they'll say, we had this many people who identified as women, this many who identified as men, and this many who identified as third, gen third gender. And then they throw those ones out, and they still run the data. And so that kind of thing um, is really upsetting, and trying to figure out how we can say, just because somebody doesn't fit into whatever your standard was doesn't mean it's wrong and doesn't mean it should be excluded. So part of what we want to do is get those numbers up so that they can't throw them out. So it doesn't make any sense to throw them out. They're significant enough. They have to be included. I'd like to offer another question. Yeah, I think you've had your hand up for a while. Yeah. Um, our company does uh, in product development, uh, commercial product development. Um, for We're an agency, so we do for other companies. Um, and we do, I, I'm less familiar with like large scale research. We do kind of usability studies for the products we're building. Um, we work uh, kind of similar crowdsource model. We work with Fable, if you're familiar with Fable, to make sure we're including users with disabilities in our product development lifecycle. Um, but those are small, very small studies. Like we'll, we'll do, you know, five to ten users in the UX wire phase and then another five to ten in um, UI design and then as we go into uh, development. Um, is Vera... Um, also a fit for those use cases, those very small kind of qualitative usability study cases, or is this really more kind of larger scale um, I, I, uh, I would scientific say, studies? I would say all of the above. I mean, first of all, we don't know exactly. We're not gonna push something on <laughs> the world and expect them to use whatever it is we think is the right thing. But I will say that I think at the heart, one of the potentially cross-cutting values will be the ability to collect data and aggregate it in one place for people and do things in parallel. What happens in those places? It could be almost anything. It could be that researchers want to do a study in a particular place because the participants need supervision or they need special equipment or something like that. There's no reason they couldn't use it. It doesn't have to be people's living room. It could be there. There could be 10 people doing it sequentially in the lab, and they could still use Vera to collect the data if they wanted and analyze it and make it available to other people. So I think at the essence, that's probably the minimum sort of least common thing that would be useful to everybody. How it's used beyond that, we're happy to see any use. And once we get it up and running. Yeah. That's a good question. Yeah. Sorry, just add on. One of the things that sort of drew me to the project is the, the possible diversification, right? So if you need five to 10 participants, um, my guess is that you're getting those regionally. Um, so we might be able to offer you a, a big pool from which you could choose five to 10 and they might be anywhere. The anywhere-ness though might be a, 
problem, depending on what sort of technologies you're testing that might include shipping costs or something that we can't foresee yet. Because a lot of, I think, what we've talked about has been yeah. participation in virtual environments. And, and it's in our list of things to think about. But generally, it would be asynchronous stuff, so people would be doing things independently. But we're also thinking about how to prepare for doing things that are synchronous. So people could meet with a researcher and have a discussion, or they could meet in a group and have a discussion. That's not the first thing on the list, but it's in the list. So, yeah, great. Thanks. Yep, yep. Other questions? Could you wait just so I can see that this is up? Do you want sure, me to Christine, just go quickly ahead. go through this? I realize and that I know people... we've got one question over here and one question over here. Still yeah. Thank you. Don't sure. Yeah. And this is just, it might answer some of the questions that are coming up because this comes from experience. Um, let me just move forward. I've mentioned who Open is. You know, we basically do research with people with disabilities who identify as disabled, but also those that don't. So people who just move, sense, think, feel, or communicate differently, but may or may not identify as disabled. And the biggest community of people that don't are the older generation that just have changing functional needs, but don't actually own to an identity of disabled. Um, as I mentioned, in the last five years, in fact, we've got one of our clients here in the room, um, Story Futures, but we've worked with a whole range of different organisations, as I mentioned, academic, uh, academic um, you know, government organisations, entertainment, and, and actually commercial organisations as well in there. This is what we've been talking about with Vera a lot. You know, what's the difference between a panel and a community? Um, this goes right to the heart of Open. In fact, even our logo, you can see the yellow splodge in the middle is our community. Right at the heart of who we are is community. The community is now over 25 years old. We have 1,250 people, in fact, more than that now, um, in the UK, USA, uh, Australia and Ireland, um, and about 350,000 people in 25 countries, uh, 23 countries, sorry, um, through partnerships. You mentioned partnerships. I think they're critically important, especially when you're moving into culturally as well as linguistically different environments. So some of the things that we think really distinguish user panel from community, so some of the things that make such a difference to being able to do either longitudinal or broadly uh, inclusive research, it's that going beyond transactional. So we're just talking about this, you know, shared value. And actually, if you're going to create a data pool that becomes a data lake, that becomes a data ocean of really valuable insight, Share it with the people you gave it, who gave it to you. So shared value. And values as well, not just value. Ongoing relationships that build over time. Relationships that actually ask, what can I do for you, not what can you do for me, but are both sided. And in fact, you were talking about inclusive platforms. We've just built, um, spent the last two years building an inclusive platform for our community that is beautifully accessible, but also has a whole lot of propositions on it that respond to what we are, what were asked for by our community when we researched into them a few years ago and said, if we were to build this, what would you want on it? Um, ethical, so fair value, but also confidence and trust that things will be used in the way that people agreed to upfront. So not starting in one way and then it getting distorted along the way and building confidence over time so that people feel that they can share really openly. The long-term commitment, both from community to the organisation and vice versa. Cultural aligned, we have a culture in our community um, and that is people that are creative renegades, so people that are frustrated with where things are today but actually want to change it for the better and considered and considerate design. And you were talking about researchers want this. Actually they do, but there are a few things that really hold people back from this. And I really, I see two of them being um, the complexity of it, it is complex and therefore how do you just step in and feel confident? And secondly is the confidence and having the skills and competence to be able to do disability inclusive research that itself is inclusive um, and, and designed for, with and by the community. Um, the other one is what distinguishes research from insight. You can do a lot of research but insight informs decisions. Um, Insight actually is a motive as well. It doesn't just inform a decision, but it really makes people want to make the better decision. So to me, you know, this, these three examples all came from um, a, a lab we ran last year teaching people around inclusive research. And, you know, engaging with tools, engaging with community in the way that they best want. This is um, one of our community members. He likes sitting on the floor and he likes sitting and engaging in the way he does. We put everyone where he was. And then that, um, this is one of our participants in, in uh, 
um, who was there learning, who on the second day had his new T-shirt, The Future is Accessible, and just so proudly wanting to be that change in the future. That's that emotive feel of, dang, we can do better here. And we were hearing just in the last panel of how flawed our current research and design practices are if we take from 2D and play them forward or take from current spatial computing and play it forward. We're going to get this wrong. So really challenging what's there. Um, yes, so making, it, making insight is synthesised to be understandable. Understanding is a really interesting point too. You can do very inclusive research but misunderstand it if you don't have the lived experience of what was shared with you. So right through to the synthesis and analysis phase, co-creating that with community, not just for the community. So not just the design of the research, but taking meaning from it and then applying that meaning to specific questions, which is what really worries me about taking it outside of the original question into new questions. Suitably accurate, as I said, it's all inaccurate, just suitably accurate for the question. Engaging both emotionally as well as practical, practically, as well as uh, inclusive emotionally and practically, um, and contextual. Talk about the exclusion footprint. So recognise that, you know, I mentioned... Oh, Christine, just, you're going to have to have you wrap yep. up in the next few minutes so we can get That's the okay. uh, next people up. Um, I just want to show you this picture on the... Your left here. This is uh, one of our participants. He's short of stature. He's also a deaf ASL and BSL user. Um, it was thought that he wouldn't be able to engage in this research because we were talking about form factor before with Christian. Form factor meant that it doesn't work with cochlear implants. It also doesn't work with a very small head with a very small neck. So we actually had to hack a system so that he could engage. Otherwise, back to your point, Tabitha, who's missing? Who have we already excluded because the form factor is not working for people? So really getting creative and actually designing the research itself to be creatively inclusive. So we, do we need to wrap up here or? Yeah, I think so. We have to okay. want to make sure to get everybody out to lunch on time. We're all here. I'm here through today and tomorrow. Um, most of the lot. So come ask questions if you like or w at ucf.edu, send email. We're doing the breakout session as yeah, well. Absolutely. And we're going to be at the breakout session. So if you want to talk in more depth about some of these things, come join us, please. Thank you all. Thanks. All right, well, everybody, please give a hand of applause for a fabulous panel.